Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this video and this video will be all about turbulence and how it's modeled. So firstly the reason I'm making this video is for quite some time I was reading a lot of literature about turbulence and stuff but I didn't really understand the terms and the stuff I was reading wasn't really grounded in any sort of intuition and a lot of them was just sort of going straight into equations that I couldn't really relate to. So I thought I'd just share today my understanding of turbulence and how it's modeled with you. So let's begin by talking about the structure of turbulence uh, with a poem by uh, Lewis Fry Richardson, which is, big worlds have little worlds that feed on their velocity, little worlds have smaller worlds and so on, to viscosity. So uh, the idea here is talking about the structure of turbulence. So if we consider a sort of cup of coffee that we stir, so I stir the cup of coffee and then after about five minutes all of that kinetic energy is somehow dissipated to a fractional increase in the temperature of the coffee. So it's dissipated as heat. So the way this actually happens is that you've got a big whirl and then perhaps at the perimeter of those worlds, you would have smaller, smaller ones, and then so on and so on. And so these worlds get smaller and smaller until it gets to the sort of viscous level where the energy is quickly uh, sort of absorbed by that viscosity into heat. The process of the conversion of energy from the large uh, motions to the very, very small is known as the cascade of energy. Now, due to this exact process of very, very big motions being converted down smaller, smaller scales and also down the time scale, so those little worlds happen much more quickly than the big worlds, for this reason, it's quite difficult to model it because if you're trying to you know, numerically solve the Navier-Stokes equations and also uh, replicate this effect, you need to be able to capture all of the length and time scales so you need a very high uh, spatial and temporal resolution simulation in order to capture all of this data so let's talk about why that's important firstly to actually capture everything uh, if you consider the uh, momentum equation of the navier-stokes equations shown here on the screen this equation is basically newton's law force equals mass times acceleration applied to fluids so on the left hand side we have the acceleration term and on the right hand side we have the force terms. The first part is the pressure gradient and the second part is the friction due to uh, viscosity. If we consider a car traveling at 60 miles an hour the pressure term will be around a million times bigger than the viscosity term. So you might be considered to drop the viscosity term and just solve for the pressure term. Now the problem with doing this is that if you, by definition, if your fluid has zero viscosity, then the drag will be zero. So obviously, you can't just do this. A more practical example of the interaction between the tiny scales and the large scales is this experiment uh, known as the Prandtl wire trip experiment. So here you've got a perfectly smooth sphere in a, sphe a sphere in a flow, and here in the other picture. We've added a tiny wire. The diameter of the wire is only one one hundredth of the sphere, but yet um, it's had a massive effect on the flow and also a massive effect on the drag of the sphere. In fact, the drag has decreased. So this is another illustration of how the tiny scales do have an important uh, impact on the flow. So this just highlights the, the, the difficulty with, firstly, the, the importance a tiny difference in the tiny scale can have a big in impact on the overall flow. And secondly, you know, it's difficult to resolve all the scales because you need a very powerful computers. So uh, one branch of simulation that actually resolves all the scales is known as direct numerical simulation. For this, you need very, very powerful, probably supercomputers, and they're limited to very small geometries for this reason. So the question you may be asking is, well, are we stuck here then? Because we, we just can't resolve everything. 
um, for like practical applications like planes and cars and trains and trucks. But luckily, luckily for us, about a hundred years ago, uh, someone found out something interesting about turbulence known as the Buzanesque hypothesis. So this is basically the idea that turbulence has an effect of thickening fluids. So turbulence causes fluids to behave like they're more viscous than they really are. And you can understand this if we look at the actual cause of viscosity, which is the uh, tiny interactions between molecules and very viscous fluids, the particles are able to transfer their momentum onto other fluids. So when one particle wants to move, it causes the other particles to move in that direction. And so in that way, it makes things thick like honey. You know, if you try to dra drag your finger through honey, a lot of it's going to try to move. Whereas just water, it will just easily sort of move through. So turbulence can have the same effect in a fluid. So by those small eddies we've talked about, uh, it actually improves the way that the momentum is transferred, uh, you know, from one part of the fluid to another. So this has been a very useful discovery because most models use this idea to say that if we're able to, you know, model the effects of turbulence, then we can know the overall flow without actually having to resolve each and every tiny little eddy. So a lot of turbulent models incorporate something known as the eddy viscosity. So this is basically an additional viscosity added on to the current viscosity, which is basically accounting for the effects of turbulence on that flow. So in terms of simulations, we've got you know DNS on one side and then on completely the other side where turbulence is fully modeled, we've got Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equations or the RANS equations. So the idea for the RANS method is that we're able to estimate the eddy viscosity um, in different parts of the flow using different methods. And by doing that, we can actually replicate the effects of turbulence without actually having to model the eddies. So this model is fully steady state which means that there's no time aspect because everything is averaged over time. So it gives you the sort of overall steady state effect of the flow, as in uh, if you took a flow and averaged everything over time, that's what it would look like. And then sort of in the middle between DNS and RANS, you've got large eddy simulation. So large eddy simulation, only the very, very tiniest scale eddies are modeled and all the rest is actually resolved. So that saves a lot of sort of computational power compared to uh, DNS, but it's still quite heavy in terms of computational requirements. The limit of the size of the eddies you can model is subject to some assumptions about the flow. So you can actually, you're only able to model those and the rest of it is must to be resolved to get an accurate simulation. So for the LES or large eddy simulation uh, method, it's still quite impractical for real life applications. So, in a, so what they've done is blended the RANS methodology and the LES methodology. They blended them together, and so and this is known as the detached eddy simulation, so or DES. So where the, there's enough uh, resolution to model the uh, eddies correctly. They use the LES method, and in everywhere else where it's, uh, there's not enough temporal or spatial resolution, then they'll use sort of a RANS model to compensate for the turbulence. So detached eddy simulation is a good all-round um, simulation for sort of unsteady effects, like uh, inst if you're studying instabilities or sound or anything like that. For most practical things, the RANS is the best way to go because it's reasonably accurate and it's computationally has a low demand. So yeah, that's basically my little introduction for you to turbulence, what it is and how to model it and how it's modeled, sorry. And um, 
So I just thought I'd share that with you so that if you're going on to see more videos, maybe about equations and stuff like that, you've got a better intuitive understanding of what's happening and you'll be better uh, armed for that. So yeah, thanks for uh, listening to the video. I hope you like it. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll probably post some more CFD videos soon since, since you guys seem to like it. Thank you.